Good evening, and uh, thank you for watching Tom Mesro, Method to the Madness, brought to you by MJVictims.com. When, uh, when one thinks about the allegations, sexual abuse allegations against Michael Jackson, one name seems to come to mind, and that name is Tom Mesero. For those who don't know who Tom Mesero is, um, he's a very famous defense attorney out of California who has represented many, many high-profile clients. And one of those clients was Michael Jackson. He was successful at getting Michael Jackson acquitted in 2005 of all charges, all 14 counts. Um, tonight, though, however, we're going to be not we're going to be looking at Tom Mesro in 2016, after the 2005 trial, and discussing why he seems to want to insert himself into these new allegations that were brought by Wade Robson and James Savechuk. So in order to look at this, we need to go back to March 8, 2013. March 8, uh, TMZ broke the story that Wade Robson had, had now, was now accusing Michael Jackson of sexual abuse. Um, it was on that same day that Tom Mesero went on TMZ and actually discussed some bizarre conspiratorial theory that this was somehow tied to AEG. Katherine Jackson at that point was suing AEG for the wrongful death of Michael Jackson. And it seems rather strange that Tom Mesero would insert himself in this discussion, seeing that at that point nobody had any real hard information on what was going on with the case or the allegations. Tom Mesero seems to pride himself on being very, very detailed and doing a great deal of research before he comes to um, any sorts, sort of conclusion. But in this case, he was more than willing to insert himself into these um, and, and give opinions on these allegations with little to no information whatsoever. So one needs to ask, why would Tom Mesro do such a thing? Well, it's one has to look back after 2005 and realize that since that trial was over, Tom Mesro has been more than willing to go on many various outlets and talk about the accusers of Michael Jackson. And at that point, it was only Jordan Chandler, Jason Francia, and Gavin Arvisa. And in, in even during those years, he was basically saying that these cases were, not, were basically nothing but a money grab, that these accusers and their families were doing this nothing but for the sole purpose of money. And that is exactly was his opinion in 2005. That was the whole premise of his case, that the RVs was, were really using Michael Jackson as sort of an easy target to shake down and, um, you know, receive monetary compensation. But one also has to look at the fact that the 2005 case for Tom Mesro is somewhat of his crowning jewel. So when you look at the, all the cases that he sort of represented, the Michael Jackson case, without doubt, is the most high profile and one that he's, he's the best known for. So it would make sense that Michael, uh, Tom Mesero would want to go on various outlets and discuss this successful case. It's very, very difficult to get that sort of publicity, and especially to get that sort of publicity for free. It puts your name front and center over and over and over again for any high-profile candidates or, or people who are looking for someone to represent them as a defense attorney. So it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever that Tom Mesero would discuss this case and guard it um, with, with a great deal of care, which he seems to be doing since the 2005 trial. Now, the other strange thing Tom Mesero seems to like to do on a routine basis is go on what I call these sort of um, internet uh, sycophant slash uh, MJ fanatic type radio programs. A gentleman by the name of King Jordan who does a radio program which discusses various topics. But one of his famous topics to discuss is obviously Michael Jackson. King Jordan seems to be a um, somewhat of a fanatical fan when it comes to Michael Jackson and has no problem defending him on any, in any level when it comes to these charges and takes great offense to anyone that might 
basically challenge him on those uh, sort of beliefs. But Tom Mesro has been on this particular show over and over and over again. And you will see as these slides sort of continue, you'll see various pictures of Tom Mesro and the King Jordan radio show on, on different dates discussing uh, different topics in many ways celebrating the, uh, the life of Michael Jackson. But what needs to be said is, is that it seems rather peculiar that Tom Mesero would be discussing a case which he is not representing in any way, shape, or form. It just doesn't make any sense that he would want to discuss these, um, this particular case especially a civil suit, where he has really no sort of representation of Michael Jackson, wasn't hired by the estate at all to represent Michael Jackson. He seems to want to go on and various outlets and, and discuss these new accusers and make claims that they're lying and all this is nothing but a, a money grab. And it seems rather strange and peculiar that he would even want to go there. But we need to take it a step further. And what I believe is that Tom Mesro understands the fact that the 2005 case is his ticket. And his ticket to getting other high-profile cases. And it's his ticket to pe for people, and legacy almost, for people to remember him by. And it would be very, very sad if a civil trial came forward in 2017 or 18 that challenged this sort of um, belief that Michael Jackson was acquitted of all charges and that in sort of in theory um, makes him innocent of, of all allegations completely which we all know is totally untrue the fact that Michael Jackson was found not guilty of child molestation against Gavin Alvizo in 2005, in no way, shape, or form, obviously, um, means that he is um, innocent of other charges against him. And in many ways, if you look at the Gavin Alvizo case, the whole basis of that case was it was nothing but a, a sort of money grab, and that the Alvizos were out for nothing but a, a quick dollar and that Michael Jackson was an easy target. But if you actually look at the case and listen to Janet Alviso, before the case had even started, she was asked if she was going to be going after a civil suit and what she can obviously obtain monetary compensation if she'd won that suit. And she said, no, she was not, but she did not want the devil's money. And even after the case was over, when she had done her sort of obligatory criminal trial, she was asked again, will there be a civil case? And again, she stated, no, she did not want the devil's money. Now, many people would state, well, she had lost the criminal trial, so that must mean, in general, that there's no way for her to file a civil trial and be successful. That, unfortunately, is not accurate. The um, burden of proof in a civil trial is much, it's, it's much lower than it is in a criminal trial. And evidence that wasn't allowed in the criminal trial in 2005 could easily be admitted in the civil trial um, later on. The other thing that needs to be noted is Michael Jackson in 2005, after that trial was over, was pretty much, he was on the ropes. He was um, very fragile, and I don't know if he could really would have been able to handle another trial even a civil trial at that point. So if they wanted to go after Michael Jackson's civil trial, I think they would have, um, in many ways, either found some sort of settlement or found an easy way to turn that into a dollar. The other thing that needs to be mentioned is, is that a civil trial wasn't the only way that Michael Jackson, uh, that, uh, that uh, Janet Arvizo could actually parlay this into a money-making sort of bonanza. Um, what people need to realize is back in 2005, this trial was not only being covered in the United States, it was being covered by an international audience. 
and many of those international outlets, I re- I'm sure, would have been more than happy to pay for a great deal of money to get an interview with the Arvizo family, especially Gavin Arvizo. And that's never happened, even up to this day. And even Ron Zonin, who um, no, who was uh, friends with Gavin Arvizo, known for years, and even went to his wedding, has stated that Gavin Arvizo has had many offers, six-figure offers, to tell his story. And he won't, because he does not want people to believe, in his opinion, the lies that were told about him and his family, and that they were nothing but grifters and out for money. And him and his family sort of almost somewhat put a, a sort of private protest by not asking for money. The next thing that needs to be brought up is that there was actually a challenge made to uh, Tom Mesereau that happened on Gervie's Law. This happened just recently, roughly about a week and a half ago. And what happened was, was that the uh, lawyer for Wade Robson, Vince Finaldi, made a challenge to Tom Mesereau to debate him. And he could say any time, any place, and he even offered to um, give $10,000 to a charity of Tom Mesereau's choice if people felt that he did, was not the sort of victor in that debate. But he also stated something uh, very interesting. He stated that he was going to, he wanted to debate Tom Mesro because he felt that there were things that Tom Mesro did in the 2005 trial, especially when um, preparing the Robson family for their testimony, that might have been a little bit out of the ordinary. So that doesn't surprise me that that debate never got brought up. And what also is rather strange is, is that over the, um, since 2013, Tom Mesro is, is continually sort of um, criticize the lawyers for the estate, including Attorney Weitzman, in which he stated that he was more than certain that there would probably be a settlement because in the past, this is what these attorneys have done, and more than likely they wouldn't be able to handle a trial. But when asked on Gerby's Law whether or not he would be more than willing to represent Michael Jackson, if that came down to it, he said yes. But that's rather strange. Why would somebody who would be willing to represent Michael Jackson in a 2017 or 18 case be so uh, so willing to insult the lawyers that would probably be hiring him? They, it puts them in a very bad position because if they do hire Tom Mesero, then what happens is it makes them look like they are um, basically incompetent, that they are unsure of themselves and that they need a lawyer like Tom Mesero to represent the estate, which I don't, I can't see any lawyer admitting to that fact. So it almost seems like Tom Mesero is putting that out there so he won't have to represent Michael Jackson. And the other thing I believe is Tom Mesero has talked about a settlement and how sad it would be if there was a settlement. But it's my opinion that I believe that Tom Mesero actually wants a settlement. It would make more sense because if there was a settlement, then what would happen is, is that his argument that this was nothing but a money grab, this was all for money, would still stay there. And this other argument that, um, uh, this other belief that the 2005 trial was so strong and Michael Jackson was totally vindicated, that might be put in jeopardy, which means that his legacy might also be put in jeopardy. And I believe that 2005 trial and Tom Mesro's legacy is, is nothing but a house of cards. And if the 2017 um, or 18 case does come to fruition, they might actually find things out that happened in the 2005 trial that maybe Tom Mesro doesn't want to get out. Maybe some sort of tactics or maneuvers, or maybe even some possible payouts that we don't know of. And it wouldn't surprise me in one bit if Tom Mesro is, is, you know, uh, basically putting on a good offense at this point because he knows that if this does go to trial, he might come into question. And again, we need to think why would what the motivation would be for Tom Mesro to even be inserting himself again into these allegations. It really makes no sense. He even says he's not involved. And in 2013, when he first came on the scene discussing it, 
He had no indication, no information whatsoever, whatsoever on the Wade Robson and Michael Jackson case. So we now have to think about when we listen or hear Tom Mesero go on a program and discuss these allegations, what his motivation really might be. Is it really about, um, again, showing that uh, in his mind, Michael Jackson would never harm a child? that Michael Jackson is 100% innocent of these allegations? Is that the real motivation behind all this? Or is there something else that maybe we're just not seeing? Or maybe we just missed? I, In my original opinions, I just thought Tom Mesrell lacked a sense of empathy. But as the time goes on, I, I seem to think that maybe I may have been wrong in that theory.